a website from the robot manufacturer. It's just like the Lockheed Martin website, except that you've got these giant robots and stuff. So. Yeah, I have a, I have a um, studio up in the morning. We used to work for industrial life, dude. So I yeah, with the half and half. All right. I'm a digital production company, pretty much like nothing, commercial company, but we work for online and uh, interactive content. And this is um, an artistic project from um, our um, you are being introduced to the whole initial plot, this is a prologue, uh, where you discover that some people have been reported missing and basically you will be trying to understand what's happening. It's a film where you get to move from one part of the film to another. Um, so once you got the whole introduction um, and you be introduced to different characters, then you can move on like this to move to the next part. And for each part, you will gradually be introduced to the different characters. Um, and the, the story will not be like a linear story. It will be different pieces of information that you receive gradually and gradually you're making the whole storyline. Good. For advertising agencies, but this, this type of work, for example, is for the, the art uh, festivals. Um, it's a showcase work, so it's been shown in different uh, new media and short film festivals. Absolutely. Directly by the um, director itself, he showcased his own version. Each night he can put together a different version of the same movie. Okay. Um, going from the beginning to the end of the storyline uh, with a different, um, a different path. Yeah. It's, it's a story is initially based on a movie from uh, Jean-Luc Godard, who was born in the 70s and he's taking some characters from this movie and kind of making an, uh, an interactive version where you get to move yourself within the story and, and discover the different characters. This society is based in London, there are about 70 people in bureau in San Francisco. I continue in French. D'accord, yeah, 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 y
it does get to be a little bit uh, tough to comprehend. It gets to be a little unwieldy, especially if you want to take full advantage of transmedia and have your content on multiple devices in multiple formats. Well, it gets even more confusing when you think about how am I going to deliver that content? So, okay, I've now made my content, I've got it on multiple different devices in different formats. Now I need to get it out to the world. I need to stream that content. I want it to play. I don't want it to buffer. I want people to be able to maybe purchase content. They're going to put a paywall in front of it. Oh, and by the way, security is a big deal too because we don't want content getting stolen. Well, that's where Fordella comes in. So we've been doing this since 2006. Uh, myself and a couple of other team members came out of Lucasfilm where we built out a platform for doing cloud-based digital asset management. And we're really proud of what we've developed and we think that's got some real importance to what you all are trying to do here today. So the idea of being able to manage multiple types of content, deliver them anytime, anywhere, it's exactly what we're all about. So how do we do it? We've got a cloud-based architecture. Everyone loves the cloud, it's a hot thing to do right now. Well, why is that? It makes it infinitely scalable. You don't have to worry about running out of space. You don't have to worry about running out of storage or delivery methods. You can basically scale up or down based off of your needs. That's helped my company. I certainly recommend, if you're not using cloud-based services, look into it. Uh, for us, it allows us to take care of customers, everyone from NVIDIA and Panasonic, all the way to small folks that are just doing one or two films or different types of content. Makes it so you can go from a little tiny content or massive content. So what makes us unique? You said, Jason, a lot of people are doing video. I can use YouTube. I can use Vimeo. I can use different types of tools to be able to deliver content. Well, as content needs continue to grow, and as different delivery systems grow, it makes it very, very important that all of these pieces through the entire transmedia ecosystem are scalable and modular. So if you take a look at this slide that's on the screen right now, it talks about everything from storing content, delivering content, play content, do I need to be able to watch on my phone, do I need to be able to watch on an iPad? Well, all of these things get very, very tricky and complex. That's why we're here. So a couple of quick examples. Uh, NVIDIA 3D Vision Live, if you're a 3D fan, I definitely recommend you take a look at it. We're actually demoing it right over here. Wave your hand, Scott, Giselle. Uh, so we're going to be demoing 3D Vision Live after the show, so come by, put on some glasses, watch 3D streaming. Um, stellar in-flight entertainment. You get on airplanes all the time, you realize there's movies, there's audio on the plane. Well, how did that get there? Well, Fordella has a big part in getting that content to multiple devices. And then lastly, Panasonic is also a really big customer of ours that we're proud of. So, now I've got to do my sales pitch. Package is starting as low as $199. We've got a special 20% discount today, so come see any of us. We've got Team Fordella all over, all over the space. Um, lastly, uh, Transmedia Jam. We're really excited about this. So, uh, this is our first event that we sponsored. We're now sponsoring the Transmedia Jam, which is going to take place at our offices. So, we're not far away. We're just over on Kearney Street. It's going to be on July 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Come find me or come find Maya, and we'll tell you all about it. With that, I'll get you to the show. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, we're very, you know, we're, we're very excited about the Transmedia Jam. It's a new, it's uh, a new event for us in San Francisco. It's going to be in the in the mode of game jams and uh, story hacks and forty eight hour film fests bringing people together from different maker backgrounds, developers, designers, writers, filmmakers, bringing people together to make a transmedia story in a weekend. And we're really excited to be working with Cordella to host this, uh, and we hope that we'll see you guys there. Um, the sign up, you can sign up for news on, the, on it uh, on the website transmediajam.org. And now I'd love to, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Ken Eklund, who's uh, a, sorry, Ken Eklund is, um, he's a game designer, I remember this guy, he's a game designer, he's long been interested in the, in the positive social effects of massively collaborative experiences and open-ended play. His, ground, his groundbreaking and award-winning game, World Without Oil, uh, has served as a landmark in the Games for Good arena. Uh, and I've had the good fortune to work with Ken on a number of projects in which he's been a constant source of inspiration and resourcefulness, and I'm so excited to share 
some of that with you guys tonight. Uh, currently, he's putting putting his 20 years plus experience to work on his latest project, Ed Z Omega, which is a game that reimagines the future of education and it's premiering this fall. Uh, so I have a couple. I, so we're going to do this in a kind of uh, fireside chat mode. I brought my fire. Uh, I can thank Ken for that joke. And so I wanted to kick this off with really the question that, with really the topic that you raised um, in when we started talking about what you want to say here, uh, which is. Authentic fiction, and so that's a term. That's a, a term that you've been using to describe what you do, and I'm wondering if you can just maybe say what it, say what say what that is. Sure. Um, so if you if you think about historical fiction, uh, I think you can kind of start from there and begin to move into authentic fiction. Uh, and so, of course, I've been doing this sort of authentic fiction for a long time before I actually came up with the words to kind of summarize it. But the, the bottom line is that the fiction seems really real. It seems like it could happen. There might be some sort of leap of faith um, around it. But then the fiction also kind of believes itself in a way. It's not um, hoaxing, um, but it is self, uh, you know, it refers to itself. Uh, it doesn't know that it's a game uh, and, and that sort of thing. And I can talk a little bit about kind of the origins of it. First, there was, I, I worked in the kind of the commercial game industry for a long time. And there are several different approaches you can take when you're uh, working in commercial games. You know, one is you can kind of create a narrative which people who are playing the game experience. And then the other one is you can kind of create some sort of sandbox or some sort of slice of reality that people can kind of assemble their own story in. And so that was very much the approach that I took. I really thought that the story that people would make out of the tools that I could provide would be much more meaningful to them than any story which I could devise. So, so I tried to make things where I would support a bunch of possible different narratives that you could experience. And then I began to realize some things you know, as kind of the internet age came upon us. Um, one of which is that crowdsourcing, um, it just wins uh, for a lot of questions. Uh, because when you get a whole bunch of people together, you know, collectively they are, they are super smart. Um, and they know a lot. And especially when you're trying to envision something that's hard to envision, um, they can do that collectively better than experts seem able to. Um, and then I think the, the last thing you know, um, what's the last thing? <laughs> well, we were talking about why um, the the authentic voice and what that you know having having a multi what what it means to have something be multi voiced instead of the yeah, and, and that's kind of the crowdsourcing thing. You know, the fact that no, even even when you're talking about a novel, you know. I, I can't help it. I mean, I read um, Harry Potter, for example, and I just there are just some places where J.K. Rowling just didn't get it right, you know, and I just rewrite those in my mind. And I think that really kind of holds true almost for any fiction. Certainly for there are a whole bunch of movies that I've seen where I just go, you know, they, they missed it right there, because you know, that would never actually happen that way, but you know, generally speaking, this, the story is good. So can you talk about briefly how you apply that to World Without Oil? Sure, yeah. Just to, just to because some, some folks in the audience might not you know, yeah. be familiar with World Without Oil, and it's a great example of how you are employing this. World Without Oil happened back in 2007, and it was a pretty small event, you know, kind of uh, globally speaking, whatever. So, you know, don't be embarrassed if you've never heard of it. Um, but it was kind of an interesting, it was a very interesting game, and uh, I was, um, I got to essentially an award from ITVS, which is a documentary filmmaker. So it's kind of an interactive documentary film in a way. 
And so you ask that sort of interesting question, what if our next oil crisis started like today? Um, so we picked a day, and then on the World Without Oil website, it pretended that, as a matter of fact, the oil crisis and oil crisis had started on that day. And it told you what it was happening, the price of um, various fuels, and there were postings of people about how things in their life were changing. Um, and so, I mean, I, I guess that's an example of, you know, it's not a hoax. I mean, people know that actually if they go out and look at a real gas station, it's 287 a gallon, or whatever back then it was, uh, anyway. Whereas in the game, you know, it's not 587 a gallon. But then the, the game essentially asked for people to send in reports about what their life was like now, you know, in this changed reality. And then whatever people sent in, basically we believed, we published, and we just said, oh, well, we received a report that this is happening here, and this is happening here. We're gathering reports from all over the globe, really. Um, and you begin to kind of amass this, amass this huge, multi-threaded narrative, which just got to be kind of eerily real scenic, eerily authentic. So how was this, uh in this example, you know, how is this collaborative fiction, this authentic fiction, uh, useful for addressing, in this case, uh, global oil shortage? But it's a it's a tool that you continue to use in throughout your projects. So why is this why is this tool so useful for uh, for games that have a social change uh, agenda? So World Without Oil was the thing that just kind of alerted me to this. I, I guess I would kind of felt it being a game designer for a long time without realizing it. But, but after World Without Oil was over, there were a lot of people who just said, you know, this game has really changed my life. And, you know, kind of with these unsolicited emails um, arriving, um, people, you know, uh, it, it really seemed like they had said, you know, I, I really am living my life differently because of what I've learned essentially from this game. And I began to realize that there is this, there's an openness that you have when you enter into a state of play. And when I had constructed World Without Oil, I wanted people to immerse themselves in the fiction, and I wanted to do absolutely nothing to get them out of that. So the more you immersed yourself in the fiction, the better actually you played the game. The more, we, more likely it was that we were kind of recognize the stuff that you wrote in, and that we would honor it, and that sort of thing. And so, for some people, it became this you know, daily thing where they just went into this reality, they went deeper into it, and then at the end, they just said, you know, I've just been living my life in this sort of um, very non-resilient way, this, this fragile way, it really depends on uh, a number of things. I want to live a more resilient life. And, you know, I realize now that World Without Oil was not really about oil, per se. That was kind of the narrative device but it really was about the sort of lifestyles that we adopt and the sort of limbs that people can move out on, whether they be petroleum-based or whether it be a, um, a loan that you take which you can't actually afford. You know, how far are you willing to kind of creep out on them without support? And then how much are you going to live your life where it's going to be resilient? And so that's what we're, people were talking about. Now, World Without Oil did not, I think it's, it's important to say World Without Oil did not actually tell anybody to live in any certain way. We just said, what if there was an oil crisis? And then kind of as a result of this oil crisis, fictional, there were all of these events, you know, fictional, but yet they had that ring of authenticity. So when, when people were in that play space, I think they just became very open to change. And so now I say, well, what is it that I can do to essentially get people into a play space and present them with some ideas that perhaps they hadn't considered because I believe that they're more open to actually reconsidering those ideas or advancing them in some way. So that's, um, that's actually really good. That you're ta you're so you're talking about what this play space is. So how do you design that? How, how do you design the structure that lets people tell their own story within it? What, what, what is it that you go about when you start designing something? There needs to be that kind of cathartic moment or that cathartic question. So what would an oil crisis be like and then would, would be one? Um, 
and then you need to essentially have a, 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 a vacuum, a narrative vacuum that, that people are encouraged to fill. So you don't want to be telling them what is going on with the story. You want it to be essentially saying, I don't know what the story is any more than you do. Um, and which was you know, definitely true in World Without Oil. It's kind of true in all my games. I come up with a question and then I, I don't feel any obligation essentially to know the answer to the question. I just want to, I just want to build the frame in such a way that it's attractive enough that people go and add their, their pixel of paint to try to fill in with all the ideas kind of a, about that particular, that particular issue. And, and like you were saying before, uh, maybe you can expand on how you reward behavior that you see as, well, I don't want to say good, maybe you can help me with an adjective, but how, how do you, because there's something else going on in terms of your active beyond just setting up the framework. Right, so, so when I run a game like this, um, if it's successful, then a whole bunch of people write in, and sometimes it's a whole bunch of a whole bunch. So there's um, maybe more that comes in in a day than I can read. And so I have people, I have you know, a bunch of people hired to essentially to, to look at these things and try to figure out. And we're looking for those things which ring true, you know, as in ring authentic. They don't have to hold to any particular idea, um, but they have to seem like, oh, well, there's something there. And, and certainly something which can kind of, um, it builds on something that someone else wrote, perhaps, or it just starts more to ask more of the sorts of questions that we want to ask, um, that we want to have asked, if you will. And so then, like with World Without Oil, I mean, I want to be very democratic, so I want to publish everything. And oftentimes, the players serve essentially as kind of a gating mechanism also, because they will find stuff that perhaps we overlooked, and they will just, all of a sudden, you see this conversation starting to erupt around a certain issue. And so we just go, oh, you know, how could we have missed this? This was really brilliant, you know. Um, we were busy or trying to sleep or something. So, and so, you know, we want to call attention to those things. And people are very quick to pick up on, essentially, what it is that gathers our attention. You know, they submit something. They don't get as much attention from us as they want. They look at what does, then they go, oh. I see, this, this, these things really sound really real, you know, I need to become more deeply embedded. You know, I was too flip, I was too whatever. Um, let me try again. And then you kind of get these multiple things. And then once you, people actually kind of um, score a hit, I mean, they, they're featured in kind of the daily wrap-up or kind of whatever the mechanisms are, um, then they go, oh, well, that was great. Now I, I want to keep doing that. And so you just see people kind of submitting more and more stuff. and then. Once they get that sort of kind of community going, then uh, they take people in who are trying to you know to join into the game. You just really get this engine of participation going, um, which is really just kind of um, astonishing to behold. Really. So, how do you know when you're succeeding? I mean, is it just that you're getting more people in? Is there what's a success look like in one of these games? Success looks like well. Um, there, there are many of the typical sort of measurements that you have, right? If there's a lot of buzz going on about the game, you know, you, then that's good, you know, kind of obviously. Um, if there's a lot of stuff coming in, um, that's good, although I'm not a quantity over quality sort of guy. I mean, I really look for, for people who are engaging, and, and I still kind of carry with me ITBS's mission, um, they're, they're the mission of the nonprofit really is to tell the stories that just don't get told any other way. You know, the stories by the people who don't really have an outlet. They, they're never going to appear on television, uh, that sort of thing. And so you can kind of sense, I think, when people write in and you can tell that it's really kind of coming from the heart. And so those are the things that I think are really kind of a measure where you've got someone to actually you know, kind of come forward and they're talking about something. You know, I mean, the things that people are submit for these, they're they're not necessarily true. You know, they're fictitious. I mean, they're talking about their lives in an oil crisis that doesn't exist. I mean, obviously there's a fictional element. But that being said, you know, 95 or 98 percent of what they're writing is like true and authentic to them, or can be, um, and you can just kind of tell. 
So who, who is the audience for these kind of games? Right? Do you go after any of these, you know, funders when they when they come to you, I assume want to know who's going to be playing this? Where's our where's our money going? What 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 demographics are you serving? Is that something you think about when you're designing? Yeah, but, uh, very much so. I mean, you, you start with that. I mean, uh, I'm a, I've been a freelancer for a long, long time. You start with what the client wants, right? So, um, in this case, you know, sometimes the clients have a an idea about a demographic that they want particularly to um, attract, uh, or there's there's some other parameters. Um, the project up there, uh, the Giskin Anomaly project, was a project which is done by cell phone in Balboa Park, San Diego. And so it's very much about the people who come to that park. Um, I mean, I kind of started uh, thinking about them. But, but that being said, it's typically the case with, I mean, when you're talking, if your client is a museum or a nonprofit or public media, the more that you can show where you're being very democra uh, democratic about your platform, where you're, you're not um, limiting, you're not it's not on a platform which a bunch of people do not have access to, so they cannot participate. Um, and so I really look for the platforms which are kind of the lowest um, platform that I can possibly support. So like World Without Oil, I mean, you could phone in or you could send in an email. Um, you know, so that, I mean, quite deliberately, although it was something of a headache, um, you know, we supported that because it was important to us that the pe that that we could reach those people who were, you know, not um, technological, you know, can't make a YouTube video or upload it or any of that sort of thing. So, looking for the lowest bar to, to entry possible. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and also just kind of making use of, uh, you know, these projects never have very much money. Um, and so, I uh, basically look over uh, what is, what, where are people right now? Um, I'm going to be on that platform, right? Um, I mean, when we did World Without Oil, people were on Live Journal. There were a lot of people on Live Journal, so we had a presence there. Um, you know, the, the game which I'm doing now, um, the uh, the characters uh, in Ed Z Omega are going to be on Facebook. So, you know, essentially, I just make use of those platforms. So, it seems like with something that's involves so much. Um, player participation in terms of actually making the stuff of the game. How do you how do you even go about testing something like this? I mean, what what does it look like pre-game? How do you decide that something's gonna work or not? It has to do with um, I, I, I sweat about that a lot, and there is no way to really test it. And there are a lot of decisions to be made where that is uh, Possibly, you know, that you can make the wrong decision and kind of really um, disadvantage yourself. Um, but I had my dentist once. Um, I told him I was doing this game about, I'm going to do this game about a water crisis. And at my dentist's office, they kind of know that I do interesting things. And so they kind of asked me, well, what it is that I'm working on now. And, uh, and so I just told him, oh, you know, we're going to create this, this kind of fake oil crisis online. And, people are going to write about how it's affecting their lives, you know, and he kind of said, oh, you know, well, that's really interesting. And then you could just see him, um, it just began to take hold. They just said, well then, I mean, if we didn't have oil, then this, and airlines, and the tourism, and then, and to, you know, I'm just kind of sitting there nodding or whatever, and, and he followed me up to the, to my car, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I got it, you know, I got the gun. And, and so, you know, you just do enough of kind of selective focus group testing like that, I guess, to just realize that, as a matter of fact, there are points of engagement where people just begin to spiral in on that idea. That it that there are, you ask that question and it unlocks more questions and more questions and more, and it kind of reveals this entire area um, which has just been underexamined, perhaps. Um, so I, I go with my gut, I guess it's the same answer to that question. Hmm. So, what, ha what happens if nobody shows up? Uh, it's happened. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I should say that it has never happened to me that nobody shows up. Um, 
small numbers of people uh, attended one particular project that I had, and for various reasons, um, I wasn't able to kind of um, launch the sorts of initiatives it, that I would normally do to, to make that, to correct that situation. So I won't get into it exactly. But the people who do show up are kind of in this advantaged position because you know, instead of getting the 50 or 100 things a day, I'm now getting five or six. So basically the people that are hired are all over that stuff. And so you can just see people grow. It's a small number of people, but they just revel in that attention that they get. Um, and so you're affecting a small group of people uh, in that particular case, but you still see the magic, at, you know, uh, magic happen for that group. So. so, so it scales. It works at a, it works at a more intimate level and at a larger scale. Yeah, it, it does indeed scale. And under normal circumstances, there are indeed methods that you can use where, you know, if people are not signing on, why not? Are they coming to your site but not participating? That's something you can fix, right? They're not coming to your site. That's something that you can fix. I mean, that's you know, that's a, a PR thing. You just haven't done the, the correct job potentially in, in that regard. So, so there, there are kind of fallback positions. Um, so how, how do you get? I mean, to build on that, how, how do you get people to play? How do you invite people in? It has to do with the question that you got the the kind of provocative uh, situation. A lot of it is just kind of. Uh, having a lot of faith in that question. There are always audiences that you know are simpatico to the message or the thing that you're trying to do. Um, and so you just want to make sure that those audiences know about it, uh, the project that's going on. Um, that's, you know, it's, it's it, you know, you hate to say, oh, well, it's just going to be viral, but as a matter of fact, it is. I mean, it's a unique thing that I offer the sort of participation opportunity um, where there isn't anything, there's no, I'm not lecturing about anything. Instead, it's a question about a subject, and that subject is one that everyone is concerned about and everyone has something to say about. And so there is this sort of, um, you know, people um, circling around it, kind of, well, what is this thing? Well, there's this curiosity that, um, that I think is just really powerful for, to get people involved. So, uh, when we were talking previously about this, uh, and I said, well, you know, that's, that's all well and good, but, you know, if you look at how most, uh, most people who are making things online, mostly, but will we'll tell you, well, you know, 90% of the people are just gonna look they're just going to lean, they're looking for a lean back experience. They're just going to say, they just, just show me, show me the easy stuff. And 9% of people are going to actually, maybe they'll write one email or maybe one tweet. And then 1% of people are actually going to contribute the bulk of your content. And I, you know, I said, well, this seems like that's going to be a problem. For, for you and the way that you are designing. Um, but not so much? No. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's easy. Games essentially can skew that curve. I mean, typically that curve is derived by something which is not a game. It's not a participatory, participatory structure. It doesn't have a reward system in place. You know, and so the, I think the example I brought up is, you know, um, World of Warcraft. I don't think that there's a 90% watching population in World of Warcraft. I think it's like, uh, you know, a huge population of people who are participating in that game, perhaps at a casual level because that's all the time that they can spend, but there are other people, of course, who just really um, get into that structure. So games, because they have a reward mechanism, um, can change that curve dramatically. Um, and I don't say that, you know, I get the sort of World of Warcraft numbers, um, but I'm not going for that kind of niche sort of audience. Um, and I think the games do really well. I mean, looking at the statistics and how many people participate and the quality of the participation um, is really pretty good. So you think that pyramid is wrong? <laughs> no, it just describes something other than a game. Gotcha. 
Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to throw it open to audience questions. So, if anybody's been dying. Yeah, I'm actually still not clear on what the reward mechanism exa is exactly. I mean, you mentioned getting featured, and you mentioned having other people comment on your story, but is that it? Or is there some kind of metric where I can go every day and see my personal progress or some incentive to write it again? That's, that's pretty much it. In World Without Oil and probably in other games that I do, there is a leaderboard, quote unquote, but I bury it. So essentially, if you're kind of the leaderboard type, you will find it. But if you're not the leaderboard type, you'll never even know about it. And I, and I don't um, I don't actually show you what your score is. I just have the, the raw leaderboard. Um, and for like World Without Oil, I mean, that was a motivator for some people when they found the leaderboard and found that they were number 20. You know, all of a sudden, they were just submitting all this sort of stuff. But it, it doesn't necessarily increase the quality of the content. And so it's not something that I really say. But, but I just want to kind of emphasize, you know, for for a gaming audience, you know, points and a kind of achievement. I mean, that really kind of fits into the gamer profile. But you know, the the world is largely non-gamer, um, and they're looking for more of a motivation, kind of on a human or emotional level. And so, having knowing that someone read what you wrote can be just this, this huge motivator. I mean, it's as simple as that on the internet. I mean, right? Most people just don't. You can write something and nobody reads it. Um, to, to have someone you know, who says, I read it, I understood it, I have these comments, and I thought these parts were good. That is just a really, a huge motivator for people to just say, well, that I'm going to submit more. And, and also the, the ability to tell your story. You know, I, I think that it's important to kind of point out that these games are indeed a storytelling, a story-making exercise that people participate in. So they're not like um, uh, you know, um, blog like it's the end of the world, right? Where you write one story about um, the zombie, you know, living through the zombie invasion, you submit it, and then that's over. You know, that's like a game with one move. You know, <laughs> this is a game with many moves. You know, you submit one today, and you can submit one tomorrow, or you can submit one in four hours, or kind of whatever, you get to make as many moves as you want. And it's a and it's an additive process. There's an engine at work. So Yeah, I'm wondering how you find your clients and what's the typical process in terms of developing a game with a client and what are the typical budget ranges on these kinds of games? Sure, very good question. Did everyone hear that? A client? Um, where do I get my clients? What's a typical budget range? What's the process by which um, it happens. Uh, it's all extremely um, painful. Uh, <laughs> say that. Ouch. So, um, be, because it's you know uh, because it's, it hasn't been done before. It's all brand new. So for everyone, you know, um, you know, even for me. So so people hear about one of my projects or they run into me somehow or or whatever, and so um, I get the phone call where someone just says, you know. We are, this is who we are, and we're interested in, in just knowing if you were to do a game, what might it look like? And so then I think about it, and you know, I talk to them, we have some sort of meeting where I kind of learn what their objectives are, um, and, and then we talk about what a game might be, what the, you know, and it's, and it's oftentimes it's one of those conversations where they say, well, we're really interested in this, and you know, no. And you know, this is proof six, and no. You know, that's not a game, that's not a game, that's a, not a game. And then they say something, I go, now that might be a game. So then we start talking about that, and we kind of come up with, kind of, you know. Are they like promotional games that they want, like, you know, for their brand, or their image, or their... I have um, gotten those phone calls, um, you know, and my success uh, working in that industry is just abysmal. Um, which kind of, there's... There's a whole rant I could go into, but I'm not going to as to why that would happen. But, I, but I'm always insisting that there be some sort of social element to what I'm doing. So I'm not going to do something for your brand just because basically your brand is, you know, I don't, that's not a story that floats my boat, really. Um, and so I'm going to be spending time with some story which is just more meaningful to me than you know, your particular product. Now, if you put your product with some sort of cause, then now we can talk. And, but that never seems to work. 
So, so the calls I get are from museums, or they're from foundations, or they're from um, public media uh, outlets, and oftentimes I'm kind of working those areas for myself because you know, I can't sit around and wait for the phone to ring, right? So, so then there's um, we come up with kind of a game proposal. We put some sort of cost to it. And so the, the budgets we're talking about are from $100,000 to $250,000, kind of the range, um, where you can actually get something going. Um, if you're talking about something which is kind of regional or national in scope, which a lot of internet games are, you know, if you're talking about something which is like a museum, which is very localized, then the budget might even be smaller than that. Is there a whole team of people that work with you on doing this? Or? Um, I usually do the ideation process on my own, um, you know, because, generally speaking, because there's no money at that point in time, and so it's uh, a little hard to get people to pitch in um, for no money. It doesn't seem fair to me. Um, but then, of course, as soon as we actually get a funded project, then I am definitely you know, on the phone um, looking for people um, with the skills that I need for that, you know, kind of a Mission Impossible style of um, operation. <laughs> Team um, it, it is kind of custom assembled. Um, I think the characteristic of it is that oftentimes the people that I hire have never done what I'm asking them to do before in their lives, and perhaps <laughs> nothing even similar. Um, there's there's a whole um, aesthetic that can kind of come along with these projects. Um, because they are like World Without Oil was a bunch of people who kind of had the idea of making this blog and gathering stories from people about the oil crisis. Well, they're just a bunch of people. They're not designers. They're not web experts. And so you don't need to put something that's really, you know, it's got all this flash or is really glossy or, or anything like that. And as a matter of fact, you don't want to do that um, at, a, at a point in time once you begin to actually make things glossy and smooth, then you begin to create this sort of expectation that the entire experience is going to be glossy and smooth, and it's going to continue being glossy and smooth. And so now you're kind of competing, you know, with like commercial kind of interactive projects or, or whatever. And then at some point in time you go, why did I even do this? I'm undermining my authentic message. I'm spending all this money to create, you know, to compete with people I don't want to compete with. Like so, head designers or IP people that are kind of involved in it? So, I mean, the, the crew, it depends really upon the project. I mean, I'll talk about Ed Z Omega, which is this project that I'm launching about education and starting this fall. Um, I was just in Minneapolis-St. Paul, which is where the thing is kind of centered, and I hired a bunch of um, uh, teenagers and young adults. So, young adults, people who could pass as teenagers um, on, in a video uh, and that sort of thing. And some of them kind of came from theater backgrounds, but many of them didn't. Um, I just advertised for, you know, are you good at Facebook? Um, and have you, have you ever thought about dropping out? And uh, we had quite a few responses, um, actually, to that. And so, you know, the, the Facebook skills, skills are going to be good. You know, the fact that they know how to do, um, you know, YouTube videos or stuff like that is going to be good. But, but for the most part, those roles that they're playing are completely, were completely open. And I, I decided to hire the people, and now I'm writing the roles for the people that I've hired. You know, I asked them, well, if you were to drop out, um, what would have been the reasons? You, know, you have someone tell you, well, you know, I've gone through hell at school being bullied. And so I could easily say, well, that would have done it. So I <laughs> said, just say, write that into your character. So I have, you know, seven or eight people uh, in the Minneapolis St. Paul area who are, you know, kind of as charged up, I think, as people can be, you know, waiting to do this project. So they're really excited about the opportunity to speak about what education, you know, uh, means to them. In, in some cases, I mean, they're still in school, so it means indeed talking about what education means to them. But I'm talking too much. This is supposed to be the question period. There's uh, one in the back there. Well, I actually have two questions. So the first one is, um, can you give us some examples of the kinds of questions that you might ask? And the second one is, what are the demographics of 
both the people that are answering the questions and the people that are asking the questions, how much people of color are participating in this? Okay, so what are the kinds of questions that I ask? Um, so let's see, I mean, World Without Oil is, uh, what is there, an oil crisis? Um, Sarah and I have worked on a project called Future Coast, which is what if there were voicemails from the future which um, became actual lump objects and landed on Earth? So you could listen to voicemails from a potential, from one of our potential futures from the year 2035 or kind of whatever. Um, Ed Zed Omega is what if there are a bunch of kids who are going to drop out um, kind of publicly on, online, they're going to just cease their involvement with formal education and kind of create their own uh, education. Uh, for a while I was really trying to find um, a sponsor and never did uh, for the question, what if the draft came back? Um, it, but we were had a two month window where you could um, Basically, the public could participate and decide uh, what the rules of the draft would be, who would be eligible um, for the draft. So it's kind of questions like that, uh, I guess. Um, and then the, the second part was? The demographics. Oh, the demographics. So and as part of the, um, the process by which I run these games, uh, I basically ask for as little personal information as possible, just because there are people who just don't want to give that stuff. Um, and I feel weird asking for that sort of information just to, you know, to make my life easier with clients, uh, you know, talking about. I mean, sometimes that, vol that information is volunteered, or you can tell, you know, in a world without oil. I mean, I knew that there was a high school student just because I could hear um, the buzz of high school going on in the background of some of his calls. And then one of our, um, players was very upfront about the fact that he was 78 years old and that he was driving his RV uh, with his wife um, up the coast of Oregon and uh, basically submitting his World Without Oil um, <laughs> bulletins, you know, at every rest stop, at every KOA campground, you know, <laughs> going up the Oregon coast. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I know that it's pretty widespread and, and you can kind of gather by context a lot that there's a diversity there, but but I really don't know. Okay, I, we're, I'm going to say we have time for one more question, but Ken's going to be here during the showcase. So if there are questions that you still have that, don't, that haven't been answered, you can come up and see him afterwards. Thanks. So I'm not familiar with your work. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's a curious presentation. I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in questions about like how you decide about what's the dominant narrative, what are counter narratives, and how do you position your story in relationship to that? I'm partly thinking of Edward Said and that kind of story, but in a more populist context, you could say, well, like, what about Avatar? So let's say, what if there was a, a community-based group that was saying, we're going to bring back an indigenous tribe, and we're going to make, a, let's say, a user experience that's about what it would be like to interact with that community, and what would that community be like? And so I'm engaged, actually, in a project which is doing that. So I'm asking to say, well, so I'm coming out of this sort of, uh, sometimes it's called a recovery, pro a collective transformation, social transformation process, right? And we get a little bit of funding from arts community stuff, you know, but we get no funding from media or no funding from techie people. Um, but the question really is, so there's a tribe. There's a tribe local to San Francisco. And what happens if they come back and do ceremonies? And how do we enjoin the city of San Francisco to engage in those ceremonies? So that's the online transmedia experience I'm trying to create. And uh, I guess I'm just interested first in your thoughts about how do you select narratives? And then if that were a narrative you were thinking about, do you have any thoughts? Okay, so um, probably not everyone heard that question, and I'm not sure that I can <laughs> repeat exactly what it is. But it has to do with essentially, um, what about a game idea where we're essentially re re-establishing, let's say, an indigenous group, the, the group that was here in San Francisco, let's say. Um, and how would a game, kind of a, a, a collective transformation of, uh, um, of, of uh, you know, bringing back some ideas, right? Uh, 
a culture, a sustainable culture. For yeah, example. kind of okay, real culturalization, something like that. So, but but the question logic has to do with how do you select the narratives which are going to be the dominant ones. So, so I do do enough of um, uh, an overview of the literature that I can kind of weed out things which um, you know just just seem impossible or. In a, when I'm talking about a world without oil scenario, you know, um, that's a good question. See, you, you've kind of got me floundering. Mm -hmm. The the thing that I think is important is that you just include as many narratives as possible, and you be as non-judgmental about the ones that you've got. And so, in World Without Oil, for example, like I said, I published everything everything that was submitted appears on the site. So the question is kind of what is the stuff that... Um, and so the, the, the other thing about what, what we do and, and the other thing about what we're going to do in EdZ Omega is to, to really kind of just to register on that, that heartfelt level. I mean, it, so it has, there is an element to it, right, where you are indeed responding to the narratives which are crafted the best by the writer. So you know you don't you can't always fill in for them, uh, if you will. I mean you have to be able to kind of get the stuff from there. And there is, like I said, that sort of safety net by players, right, where they can point out a narrative that you that you missed somehow um, because we were too tired or, or whatever the deal was. Now, in your particular circumstance, I mean, how you would kind of create that sort of game? Um, I mean, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Um, and, you know, the, the question is what would get people to engage with it? You know, that would be a big problem, I think, just because that's kind of a different culture. And so what in, in, in many ways you're kind of bringing up that there is this gap between that culture and this one. You know, whereas I try to find the thing which kind of brings the things together. You know, I, I, can be talking about educational reform, for example. You know, not everyone is engaged with educational reform, but everyone went through the educational process and they believe something about it as a result of their experience. They have experience they can talk about, you know, um, whether it be good or bad or kind of whatever it was. Great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Hi, welcome. So I just want to really quickly, um, can, can, like I mentioned, we'll, we'll be hanging out for the rest of the evening during the showcase. If you have more questions, you can come up and chat with him. I'm sure he will be excited to answer them. But I just wanted to highlight, uh, we have some amazing projects out here participating in the showcase. You probably, if you were, showed up early, you got to maybe chat with a couple of them. So I'm just going to really quickly run through all of the showcase participants so that you can make sure that you get to get to see all the ones you want to see. Uh, we have Sephirosa, which is uh, presented by Unit 9. It's an interactive web-based feature film written, directed, and designed by David Markinkowski. The film is one of the biggest storytelling projects combining cinema and web ever made. It features 110 scenes, three alternative endings, and 20 locations. And they have a table in the back of the room over there. Uh, unfortunately, Operation Ajax could not be with us tonight. They had to cancel. Um, but it's a, it's a beautiful project, and it's uh, available for download uh, on the App Store, so you can explore it yourself. Uh, we have Super Going, uh, presented by Citri, that's in the table right there. Uh, Super Going is a social adventure game that's played in our everyday world, but enhances it by drawing player attention to opportunities for play around them. It can be played on the web, iPhone, through physical mission cards at SFMOMA. Uh, we have Aqua for Life, uh, which is presented by X2TV. Aqua for Life is a campaign by Giorgio Armani to support the UNICEF tap, water, tap, UNICEF TAP project in an effort to help improve access to safe, clean drinking water for children around the globe. It was originally a television commercial, and X2 uh, added interactive overlays that help people understand the project in greater detail and generate more engagement with the project. 
uh, we have extra, so oh, and sorry, uh, Aqua for Life is also in the back room. Uh, we have extra solar, which is at the table right in the back there. It's a little wave. Um, extra solar is uh, presented by Lazy 8 Studios. The project seeks to be the first in a new generation of games that span the gap between ARGs, alternate reality games, and traditional games. Players are lured into the game with the promise of assisting in a search for extraterrestrial life and soon find themselves at the center of a conspiracy. We have Sonic SF, which is again in the back, in the room beyond the pizza. It's a public media project that chronicles the unique qualities and eccentricities of San Francisco and its residents. Sonic SF employs a narrative structure similar to that of Arrested Development paired with the editorial standards of NPR, and that's presented by Stacey Bond and Sonic SF. We have Morav Missions, which is an indie series in production that plunges you into the middle of World War III. You might have noticed the giant robot in the back room. Uh, the, the project uses uh, plunges you into the middle of World War III with giant robots, their crew, and an embedded news correspondent all fighting for survival in a terrifying robotic war. Uh, they, they have, I believe, a graphic, novels, a graphic novel currently available and are in the midst of producing other media. There's White Collar Brawler, which is a documentary web series that follows, the two, that follows two lifelong friends who decide to leave the office behind and train to become amateur boxers and fight each other in the ring. <coughs> It's Justin TV meets Fight Club, a story about a couple of suits looking for a life of substance. That's presented by Portal A, and also in the back room. There's Petals in the Dust, uh, which is presented by Bel Air Films. It's the Endangered Indian Girl, Petals in the Dust, the D Endangered Indian Girls is a documentary film about sun preference and gender imbalance in India. Through captivating cinematography, capturing the beauty of India, interviews and animation, graphics and art, graphics, art and murals, the film intends to create awareness about gendercide in India. Uh, and Tiger Ladies, which is presented by, I'm sorry, which is presented by Sheridan Tatsuo, T Tatsuno, Tatiana Goyenta. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I really apologize. Uh, and Hao Chen. Uh, it's a fashion comedy movie about bouncing back from tough times by banding together through the arts. The film will be accompanied by a web-based fashion contest and merchandising with the goal of building an e-fashion commer commerce business around the film. Uh, we're also joined by the Producers Institute, who, uh, uh, which is put on by the Bay Area Video Coalition, Coalition and they're here to talk about the Producers Institute for New Media Technologies, which is a week-long social impact laboratory that connects the world's best social issue documentary filmmakers and partner nonprofit organizations with leading technologists and mentors to develop transmedia tools and story assets to advance shared social change. And it's an amazing program, and if you're at all in the documentary space, you should go talk to them. Uh, I also want to thank all of our sponsors uh, who made this event possible. Uh, of course, Fordella, who you heard from earlier. We have Agni, who also has a table over here. Um, SF School of Digital Filmmaking, who's provided this wonderful space for us to meet and talk in. Uh, Match Factor, and Nas, who you've been perhaps partaking of their energy drinks. Thank you, guys. Uh, you're welcome to please go, please go visit with all any and all of the people that I just named, they're, they're here for you. They want, they're excited to share what they've been working on. Thanks.